so that you can not see the microphone. No, I'm gonna, I'm yeah. Gonna okay. Gonna... Right. This is Ollie Bown from the band Icarus. Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll ask you a question if you could have repeat that question at the beginning of the answer. Yeah. Okay. Well, no lights. Um. No, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, my name is. Yeah. Okay. So right. um, if you could uh, uh, tell me who you are and uh, what you do. Should we look at the camera, or look should at look at Daku? That's good. Okay. Okay. Hi, we're Icarus. I'm Ollie. This is Sam. We've come to Stein for three weeks to produce an album, which is um, basically a normal studio album, but um, it has the special feature that every time you buy a copy of it, it's going to vary, and we'll have a limited edition of a thousand copies of the album, and. The problem we're trying to solve while we're working at Stime is how to generate all of the variations of that album. Um, can you tell me um, yeah, how, how, how you're going about in making these variations? What's the, what's the process of, of what your process has been at Stime so far in, in building this album or making this album? So we've essentially taken a very straightforward digital audio workstation in this case Ableton Live and we've broken out all of the automation from each of each of the separate voices in each track and essentially what we're doing is varying or interpolating between various different lanes of automation per track so we'll have say four different versions of the entire track and over a thousand iterations will vary the automation for each one of those voices. So. And, um. Yeah. Um. Oh, we're going to alternate, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, let's improvise that. Can you tell me how this, this process or this, this particular work relates to your previous music and your, your previous work or even your individual works? Okay, so yeah, we've been making music together for over 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, the earliest work was very dance music inspired. Um, and around about 10 years ago, we started getting interested in um, processes and process-based process, process -based music and algorithmic music. Um, and over that period since then, we've been um, producing still studio music, also a lot of live um, electronic um, generative music or um, beat based music um, and also collaborating with a range of other musicians in a performance um, context where we're building software that maybe reacts or generates music autonomously um, or acts as an instrument, Var various things like that um, and we've been making records using that, that, that software but this is a new step for us in, in a sense in that um, we're very fixed on the idea of something that is uh, a fixed work at the end of it. Um, so it's not a live performance, but it relates to a lot of the ideas that we've developed in live performance. So we will use some of the just the, the pattern generating processes and the effects processes and we'll automate and control all of, the, all of those things as you would when you compose in a studio, which is you, know, you can stop, go back, play again, stop, go back, play again, and you can make a precise object. Can you guys tell me a little bit about... Should I turn the fan heater? Oh, yeah. Is that making too much noise? Um, it's fine, but... Uh, <laughs> Your turn. Well, can you tell me a little bit about the relationship you have with um, studio work and live work? Is it something that's drastically different for you guys or is it a kind of a conflict or is it like how do you guys deal with with uh, or is there even a division should we be repeating the questions by the way you can say how we separate the work Just from the work okay from so yeah I, um, I think our live work in a way evolved out of frustrations 
the, the kind of early frustrations of electronic music being purely based as almost like a tape or a recorded medium. So you were, in a way, either recording um, concrete sounds or uh, making manipulations with synthesizers that you would then either record or set in stone somehow. Um, and we were very inspired by, I think, a lot of jazz music and, and improvisation and just the idea of, of difference and, uh, and spontaneity and how to, to achieve that with a computer, which is very good um, at reproducing exactly the same thing every time. And it's it became a, a quest in a way to to try and find pertinent ways of uh, making a p computer do variation or design variation, and that's kind of come full circle I think in this project because it incorporates so much of what we've uh, developed for our performance software uh, and are now able. To integrate into the studio environment and be very strict about the way we we uh, predict uh, what's going to happen within uh, you know a set time frame and then over several iterations. It's really interesting how um, you guys talk about sort of dealing with computer as a, as a contemporary tool or instrument and thinking of ways of telling the computer to do things differently or to give it more sort of spontaneity. I think at Stein, typically what we did is we connected sensors and we gave, we added the human body to control the computer itself, whereas you guys are taking sort of a more inward approach of dealing with sort of generative processes. Um, what, what sort of, let me try to uh, try to formulate this question. Um, of dealing with complexity um, as sort of a, a, perform, uh, a performance or dealing with this massive complexity in the computer and linking that with sort of a real moment or a body or a performance. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll just explain a bit about Stein being different. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, it feels like we're quite an unusual um band to come and work at Stein because the tradition of Stein is about human performance and um, music being generated by the body in particular. Um, that's something we've always, you know, we're really interested in a lot of the work coming out of here, but it's never something that we've actively done. It may be something we've done with, in collaboration with musicians. Um, and really in two ways, like firstly, uh, if you produce dance floor music in a bedroom, then you're producing music that's not generated by the body and not generated by gesture maybe not and um, if you're doing generative music music programmed into a computer or behavior programmed into a computer then arguably you are doing gesture that's the computer gesturing but arguably it's just running a routine and that concept of gesture doesn't really apply in the same way so we're very outside the Stein remit it seems in that respect and yet there's a huge amount of kind of dialogue to be had on that topic which is interesting, and that's always something we've looked at doing in our performance. So we we really we've always aspired for our performance to be to sound like those things are going on, and we're standing there just mostly just using a mouse to control things. So a very low rate of bodily gesture, um, and. Um, that's something that I think that has actually started to really, I mean, it's something we've done for a long time and we've, we've debated about whether it's good to have a video playing when you're performing so that you can distract your audience from the boringness of what you're doing and these various other ways that you might kind of visually improve your performance. And I think in a way, like the, the idea that you have to do that has slightly matured and the, the thing we set out to do is kind of more possible in terms of how an audience perceives it. Now, I'll just add a bit. Um, I think also one of the parallels you could draw um, with our performance or our style of performance or our way of performing is to it, it's more like being a conductor 
in the sense that uh, you have a an instrument, um, whether that be an ensemble or, or a, a bunch of things or algorithms within a computer, that you're you know that you understand the processes that are about to happen, and you're guiding those processes on a larger scale. So, uh, in that sense, it does differ slightly, I think, from like a, a real you know a, a real time performance by a performer. It's it's much more. I think the, what we're trying to achieve is the ability to step back, and and in a way be able to judge that spontaneity in the same manner that an audience might be able to, and and therefore give uh, some kind of higher level of of uh, musical form to those uh, moments. Okay. Um. I mean, well, firstly, it's a, it's great to be able to come here and do this in the first place because uh, Ollie's recently moved to to Melbourne or moved two years ago, and so uh, in a way, this is the first time we've sat down in a studio together and written music together as such, like uh, without a performance or without a series of dates to to, to spur us on for uh, I mean, a good four or five years. Mm. And uh, so there was initially there was just the challenge of uh, okay, what are we going to do? Uh, but there was also just this great excitement about um, I guess the terrain of possibilities that have opened up in the last four or five years, where you've got the the recession of the the record as a kind of physical object, and this emphasis on performance both within electronic music and elsewhere, and it seemed like in order to or to do something musical now that's in a way relevant you had to take all of those things into context and uh, that's what we've tried to do I guess yeah I could speak about some technical challenges without going too deep uh, I'm just trying to think what I want to say yeah. <laughs> I hope you are cutting this down <laughs> <laughs> I assume, I assume it's yeah that'll be up on YouTube yeah, yeah. just a second yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, do I want to go into yeah okay um, yeah so we, we when we arrived at Stein we'd only done a, a basic amount of preparation basic testing um, we're using a very new piece of software called Max for Live which is a, is a com combination of Ableton Live which is very popular uh, digital workstation and performance software and Max which is a very popular algorithmic composition tool and they've had the genius of bringing these elements together so that on one computer at the same time you can be moving smoothly between algorithms and studio production and it's it's a dream come true in a certain sense we've been working with these separate tools for a while there's always ways to make them communicate but this is definitely a step forward but it's at a very early stage. It's it's a beta. Well, we we're using a new beta version of that software. Um, one of the challenges has just been getting up to speed, getting it getting it working, doing what we want. Um, and then the much bigger picture is okay. We've we've spent two weeks now, mostly sitting in this amazing studio, which sounds really great. We've mostly just been programming Max patches with the sound off. So um, that's just the huge amount of groundwork you have to do to get to a stage where the tools are ready to produce, um, which we knew we had to do, and we've got to that stage and we've been starting to compose, and then there's still an, an extra stage of trying to work out how to use the tools that you've just built, because there's no user manual, you just made them, and you don't really know what, what you're doing when you do that, because it's entirely experimental territory. So we've built a whole load of um, systems, and to some extent we, we iterate now, we, we go back to them and we slightly tweak their design based on what we're trying to do and the big the big challenge there is how do you make a time a, a piece of music that exists over time like any normal piece of music but it also exists over a number of versions so it's 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 kind of got two timelines it's got this timeline of the track and this timeline of the variation as it's going through so we have a dial that we can turn while we're playing the track back which is this axis here the vertical um, version axis so we can go from version zero, listen to that, flip to version a thousand in the middle of the track, and see where it's at. 
and the, so one challenge is how do we listen to an amount of music which is more than we can ever actually listen to how do we skip between all those parts another one is how do we compose all of that variation so it's interesting and we don't have straight answers to that just yet um, I could add one more thing okay. for, yeah. Um, yeah and I mean just to follow up on composing that variation we we took this this route which uh, which Oli kind of somewhat explained uh, to make everything totally discrete so there is no within the whole system that we're operating in in order to facilitate the fact that we can listen to all the different versions at any particular one time there is no uh, randomness within the patches and that that just has al already become an immense challenge because it's one of the most useful features to be able to call on at any particular point when you want to make a decision or you want the machine to make a decision that's uh, in some way you know drawn from a, an arbitrary state and so we've had to start evolving uh, totally fixed state but um, yeah, series which we can we, we can use either for sequencing or to generate breakpoint filters or all of these kind of things so yeah it's been a big learning curve in that respect because it's I think it's uh, it's very easy to just call on a random object Rephrase the questions. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I, I need to okay. restate that, don't I? Um, uh, so the, I, I, I describe this as a reflection on the current form of music distribution, rather than a comment as such. It's, um, it's because uh, I mean, we're not really saying this is good, this is bad, this is right, this is wrong. We're just saying um, this is something that we are now able to do and it seems very relevant to us because um, that m that means of distribution where it's free instantaneous reproduction of a piece of music which is now suitably taken for granted um, means that you can uh, c combine with all of the kind of um, generative algorithmic techniques that we have at our disposal means that you can do this but um, nobody's explored that compositionally so possibilities have been opened up and we're exploring that and then on the other side I suppose um, by exploring that and by doing what we're doing we, we don't really want to say now we don't have any predefined ideas now of what will happen when we produce when we put that out but we're really interested in what will happen we're re really interested in finding out how how it'll be received because I mean we, we have some ideas for example what we what we aim to do is that we distribute a thousand copies digitally um, people can take those copies and everyone gets one each and once um, once they've all been downloaded they're no longer available from our site but what we can do is um, because each of those is a unique recording we can uh, give each of the people that download it uh, unique rights to the recording we can maintain our rights to the composition which is a universal thing covering that whole work but the each recording is is a different unit and so that's an interesting idea we want to see what happens with it. and what we'll do is we'll invite people to then share that in whatever way they like they can put it online if they're a radio dj they can put it on the radio um, they can share it on um, file sharing services or you know one person could go out and try and find all of those copies um, one one idea is basically anyone who downloads it can join a, an anonymous mailing list where all of the all of the people who got the album can discuss what they want to do with it. I'll add a, um, I think it's also, I mean, that phrase uh, "art in the age of mechanical reproduction" always seems to come into my mind at a certain point, and uh, I think when now, particularly with music entering in an era where it's just so vast and open 
um, there is, you know, the cloning that goes on is indefinite. And I think there's another maybe seed of what we're trying to do. And I don't think it's massively formulated at the moment, but that maybe now there is also the kind of era of the multiple and and how you deal with that and what that means to mechanical reproduction and and in a way maybe that's something about the artist being able to take back uh, some kind of or, or maybe just comment on that 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 state the kind of multiple state of affairs uh, and i think it does maybe seek to readdress a balance where you know you have this i guess platonic view, vision of the artist and of the work of art as a, a kind of utopian ideal and uh, this maybe I mean it's very loosely formulated but maybe it pokes a bit of uh, interrogates that a bit further anyway that's, that's very interesting that you bring up. your whole I always found that interesting, the, the, the conference about uh, computational creativity and there's that whole agenda which was um, based around the rights or the the rights of the machine. Was that part of, uh, I remember the, the Doug store. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Um. I can't remember, it's kind of something about the ethics of using a machine to generate all like a, anyway, that was right. by the Do you want to say something about it? Or is that not part of your... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just going, kind of thinking of, some, of something that I'm really fascinated in, but it's, I'm not sure how related it is. Here goes. Uh, um, well, I suppose the what we're doing ties into the idea of a machine being creative, which is something that we both looked at from a kind of theory point of view um, but we're not we're sidestepping that slightly because that's something we've looked at in, in certain projects we've done and here because the whole emphasis of the project is about making a fixed work um, when you produce something fixed um, even if there are I mean there are some processes involved but as we said we're avoiding certain things like randomness that possibly have some magic, some creative spark, and we're, we're focusing on the good old traditional tools and how we're controlling them. So the outcome is fixed. So there's, in, in a sense, there's no way in which that could be related to the topic of the machine being creative. But then in a completely different sense, um, and this is something that's been fascinating me more and more recently, is um, a lot of the work in computational creativity that I've looked at has a really interesting um, effect was it, which is that it makes you look back at human creativity in quite a different light and one of one of the things which is obvious to most people or you know most people have a kind of shared understanding of that is that you're not really in charge of of all of your own creative processes you've acquired them culturally you're applying accident in various ways um, you're interacting with other people to produce something and I think I mean Sam just mentioned the idea of a kind of idealized artist and and that doesn't really exist and most people agree about that but it still manages to kind of hover around as this sort of ideal of human agency so even though we're not building machines that generate things it's related in the sense that we're building something that's way bigger than we could actually manually edit so everyone knows by the by the description of the concept everyone knows that it's something that we haven't really crafted in its complete detail in its in its entirety and in that sense we are I guess we're handing over control not really to the machine but to the to the to the generative idea in the sense that maybe like aleatory music does that there we go yeah, yeah, I got it I got it out <laughs> yeah, no, but, um, but I think I think we research and all that and then sort of the music that you kind of listen to and going up into are those meeting or are they sort of separate strands I think there's um 
relating our interest in dance music to our, our kind of interest in more academic music um, and process-based music and so on, there's there's a certain gestalt thing that happens, a sort of flipping between one and the other. You're e you're either in one camp or you're not. Um, from a personal point of view and also culturally, and that's something that I think most most people have seen slowly being eroded over the last 20 years, or maybe it's a myth that there was ever a division. Um, but I still, I, I think no matter how much that kind of gets eroded culturally, there, is, there are certain structural musical things that can't be broken down. For example, you drop a beat into a into a performance in a in a kind of concert environment and you're doing something pretty dramatic still and um, yeah I think that just comes down to the musical logic so steady metronomic music versus um, gestural uh, free rhythmic music um, you have to you can move around you can cross those boundaries but you do get pushed in certain directions as you're doing that Yeah, I think also one of the things that I think really excited us in the first place about a lot of electronic music and dance music at the time was firstly how, in a way, depersonified it seemed to be, and secondly, how it really did just mash up a lot of cultures and a lot of different influences in, in like Ollie says, I guess, it, in a really illogical way but that seem to make a lot of sense. And I think we've always had a bit of a, well, I certainly have had a bit of trouble uh, ever ad admitting to being a composer, like a, because I see that as being something that um, implies also a certain relationship to music and to culture. And it's interesting when you don't, feel like you fit into any one of those particular definitions how you create space of your own in order to to I guess vocalize what you do and uh, I think that's that's been a it seems like a constant theme throughout the the evolution of Icarus was uh, you know finding one thing that we really identified with and uh, in a sense, feeling like you fall slightly outside of the the, the interests of that particular uh, group of people, and then finding another thing that that also interested you, and you're it's constant kind of mediation between a lot of different things, and picking up a lot of influences and techniques and ideas along the way from all of those. Thank <laughs> you. 
can either do it a white point or this other. Oh, I see. So like the 22. So we should add a gate. We should add the, the binary gates. Give an introduction. Yeah, I'll pass sure. it on to you. Yeah. So, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to Stein to our Hot Pot Lab number 13. This is the first one for this year, and I keep on doing it every month. Uh, for this edition, we've had uh, Icarus, a duo from London, doing a residency here. They've been working on the new album, which is uh, the process is really interesting. Uh, so we asked him to give a presentation of that, and before then, we're going to start off with uh, Pete Concrete from the Concrete label. And uh, he runs a really interesting label based in the Netherlands uh, that has you know, gained a uh, really sort of interesting, uh, significant sort of recognition abroad. And a lot of it has to do with his sort of strong dedication to the music and his way of running uh, a label today. So I'm going to pass it on to Pete. Okay, first of all, uh, thank you for coming. Thanks, uh, Stein, for asking me on such short notice. Uh, this is a completely improvised uh, talk. So, um, basically, um, yeah, um, I'm running this uh, really small label called Eat Concrete. It started five years ago. Um, um, it's something I always have been wanting to do. Um, I had a label like uh, 12 years ago, it's called Monom. It's completely different, it was uh, more like acid techno from the 90s and um, I basically dropped out um, just before it really became quite big in the Netherlands and abroad I think. And years after um, I, it felt like I never, you know, I never uh, could really tell um, I had the opportunity to uh, to try to uh, gather a lot of interesting music and to share it with uh, the bigger audience. So um, uh, five years ago, um, I just decided it was a, a cool time to uh, just try it. I mean, I, I, I had no idea where to start and uh, how to do it, who would distribute my, my music or my friends' music. So I just took the plunge and now we're five years later and almost 25 releases uh, Later and um, so I think I'll just start with uh, I just want to play uh, a, f a few um, audio snippets so just snippets from from tracks that I released uh, it's it's really hard to um, <clears throat> in in 15 or 20 minutes time to uh, to get across uh, what the label represents I think because it's um, quite diverse. Um, so I'm just going to play you these uh, snippets and I'll just uh, give some feedback. So this is a track that I uh, released. Um, it's actually on this, this LP. It's on a, on a vinyl. I have uh, some vinyls here as well, maybe if you're interested later. Um.
So, um, well, I have my logo here. Oh, it's a bit big. Anyway, um, this is actually the, the, the snippet that you just heard was uh, a track that I released myself. Um, um, actually, the whole idea uh, for starting a label myself was that I want to release my own music. Um, but it yeah, got a bit out of hand, and now I rarely have the opportunity to, to do some decent music making myself, which hopefully uh, is going to change uh, in the near future. Uh, so, um, the, I don't really have a philosophy, uh, except that I, I, from the outset, um, I, I want to uh, release uh, a, a broad set of music. I mean, it just occurred to me that uh, being a DJ for, for 12 or 13 years, that at that time, uh, that my my record collection is, is so div diverse, and um, I've, I, I also felt that a lot of my friends have a lot of different music. Uh, uh, so it, it just seemed logical that you could start a label uh, trying to <laughs> release only the, the stuff that you like, no matter what style or uh, where you're based or what is hip today. And you know, uh, so. Uh, it, it seemed, yeah, it sounds quite naive <laughs> if you put it that way, but it really f felt quite natural. And um, but um, when I um, started to do that, uh, it, it, I soon found out that it was not so easy. But <laughs> anyway, um, I think uh, because it, it's a label uh, run by myself only, um, I can still uh, do it regardless if I have any success with one uh, record or not. I can just do it if I want to do it. I can decide uh, uh, quite uh, fast if I want to take on a project or not. And so um, after a few years, I, I, I just collected this <coughs> um, yeah, broad selection of stuff which doesn't seem to be connected to each other somehow. But I felt that if I just focused on the people that I really liked and wanted to support and um, you know, package it in really nice artwork and, and, and really cared about the whole uh, process of developing these records and releases that somehow uh, an aesthetic would emerge that uh, people would relate to. And I, I feel somehow that after five years, I've, I finally have the idea that some people are, are uh, would agree with me. But um, yeah, the whole commercial situation, reality is that you, you have to make uh, at least uh, get enough money out of selling these records to be able to take on another, uh, you know, experimental project. So I don't know. Uh, it's it's uh, still a running experiment, but I really enjoy it. It's uh, a really nice job, actually. So I'm I'm gonna play. Um, oh yeah, also uh, I uh, recorded a, a mix. Uh, it's I I think I have like 30 copies here. You can there's some artwork and a playlist there. You can get get a copy later if you like. I recorded it yesterday for a <coughs> for a friend in uh, Germany. It's, it's called Jay Scarlett. He, uh, he runs a, a show called Emsol, and I'm gonna play the first few minutes <coughs> out of this mix because uh, there's like seven different <coughs> tunes in uh, in there or something. Yo, yo, yo,
is just uh, like six minutes and ten different songs that uh, are quite diverse, I think. Um, yeah, I, I hope you, by, by listening to this stuff, that you at least understand that I uh, would like to uh, release this diversity because I think it's, when you listen it like this, it seems quite plausible. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, the tracks I played were from Coral, Hiranate, Cubus, uh, Baconet, Adva, Knallpot, and Boyking Islands. Uh, some of them um, will be released. Uh, amongst them is Coral, uh, he's a guy from Chicago. Um, I just uh, designed uh, this cover, it's going to be a 10 inch, I designed it together with my friend and um, it should be out this spring on a really limited 10 inch yellow vinyl, so hand printed, screen printed sleeve, so it's going to be a really nice project I think. Um, <coughs> so something completely different is, um, let's see. A record from Enemy Earth, I just released it, it came out uh, last month. Just a snippet. Actually, the record is uh, two sides. Um, all the songs flow into each other, so it's like a one big trip. It was produced by uh, uh, Chris Scheib uh, Scheibler, and this is amazingly talented guy. Really young. I think he's 21 or something from the U.S. I mean, it's so. I mean, it's really obscure. It's even for me. It's really hard to communicate to get some decent emails, but. <laughs> I mean, uh, we uh, we released like two records together, and yeah, um, <laughs> that's that's what what's interesting as well is that you deal with uh, some artists. I mean, in my case, a lot of most artists are not really established, so nobody knows anything about them, which is really hard to you know to to promote the record, but. In the end, it's yeah, it's also really exciting because you never know it in advance how people will respond. But I think I I, I really believe in, in 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 the releases so far. So I think it will be picked up. Uh, another uh, release from the U.S. is uh, by Blipfruit. I mean, it's yeah. Let's see, it's this one. Uh, it does it looks really crappy actually here, but. It should look quite scary. Anyway, <laughs> is um, hopefully uh, coming this time um, to do a res residency and play in June. Um, we're gonna hopefully also play together in uh, Nijmegen in the, the new uh, Oddstream Festival. Um, if all goes well, I'll be there playing next to uh, Blipford, Baconet, um, Knallpot, Optical Machines. Um, and some other guys, some just friends, and we'll see how it goes. Anyway, um, this is just a snippet from his music because most of his songs are like seven to eight minutes long. And I mean, he, a blip for it is uh, something which occurs when you, you have a, your brain uh, goes into overload and he just puts an incredible <coughs> amount of data in, inside his music. It's, it's, it's quite astonishing. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't know. 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 Uh, on my YouTube channel, you can go there uh, through the website. It's eatconcrete.net. Um, well, let's see. Oh yeah, uh, so I'm uh, the label turns five this year, summer. I think it's actually within two weeks or something. Um, I was preparing a, 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 a compilation to uh, uh, to be released around that time, but as always, this took me a, a lot longer than I realized. So um, this will hopefully um, be uh, released um, as a series of uh, EPs to be downloaded for free from my website. And um, afterwards, we're going to do a really limited release, probably with posters and stuff on vinyl or CD after, C after summer. And one of the tracks uh, on there will be from Herb Lobby. They're from Belgium, also a really cool act. some questions I don't know <laughs> not really I can imagine I, would, I wouldn't myself actually but. I have a question okay uh, do you also is it always on vinyl or how do you see future being being a small label like you could maybe do much more if you would not print it or yeah that's, that's yeah that's that's uh, catch 22 because um, um, well Suppose I, I had never released anything on vinyl, then I'm I'm quite certain that, that I wouldn't be here today. As a, I mean, I wouldn't be here in a situation where I am dealing with some artists that I am dealing with right now because it somehow it, it gave me the opportunity. Because uh, some people, you know, they, they take you more seriously, I think. But it, of course, that that's not really a reason to release vinyl. I mean, uh, basically, all, all the artists uh, and uh, the really love to see their music released on vinyl, even if they don't have a record player. I mean, that's 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 my experience as well. I just, uh, I mean, I'm 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 just like you, you know. I mean, when I can't find a record, I just download it when it's actually in the closet behind me. That's that's. I mean, even for me as a label, that's quite quite bad. I mean, that's not a, not a good sign. So. Um, I don't know, man. I really don't know. I have no idea. But I, what I do know is that for b being a bo boutique label, how do you call it? Just, I mean, right now that's what I am. I, I mean, I'm, I'm far from being a major, and um, I, I, I don't really um, care if it's if it gets picked up by a really big audience. But um, I'm well aware that uh, I have to do something. On the one hand, dealing with piracy, and on the, on the other hand, people being much more um, used to um, access 
uh, data on the internet, like the SoundCloud. And I mean, what's funny is if you have a SoundCloud, which is just basically a page where you can put your own music up and people can go there and give comments on them and listen to them, you have the ability to uh, to make them available as a download or uh, or not. And uh, mostly I, I, I do that. And but people don't even bother. They, I mean, even if they can, uh, lots of times they, they don't even download the file because why should they? It's already there. They can just press play and stream it directly from the internet. So that's basically the whole transition uh, that you, you, yeah, uh, the whole music industry is going through right now, uh, going from owning something uh, uh, to uh, accessing it, actually. And I mean, when you're talking about releasing physical projects, uh, products like uh, CD or vinyl, that's a completely different situation. I think that, as I said, being a boutique label, there will, would always be a, f uh, a market for people who would be interested in in uh, owning uh, like their physical products. I mean, imagine uh, that there would be no vinyls and no CDs on the world anymore. I mean, okay, there would be uh, everybody has Spotify and everybody can. You know, can just stream music for 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 nothing, but I don't know. It, it, it doesn't. That's not really the future I, I I would like to be in, but it's it's definitely going there. So um, I don't know. I think it's just focusing on quality and making nice products that there will be uh, an uh, ability to su to survive. But I hope at least.